Everybody is unique in their own way, so it's no surprise that climbers climb with their own style. In this series, I'm going to explore what makes some climbers climb the way they do. By exploring these unique climbing styles and talking to some people along the way, my goal is to show you the diverse range of climbing styles around the world. My name's Albert Oak, and this is Climbing Styles. In the world, there are currently three major city-states that have succeeded, and if you need a quick geography refresher, a city-state is basically a country that is only one city. The first notable one is Vatican City. It's known for its rich religious history and culture. The second is Monaco, one of the most affluent places in the world where they have high-end clubs and hold high-profile races. Finally, third is Singapore. Singapore is an interesting case because for a long period of their history, They've been ruled over by other countries, and it was only in 1965 that they gained their independence. On paper, Singaporean climbing shouldn't even exist. They've been independent for only 55 years. They have limitations on how tall buildings can be, not to mention since they're such a small country, they don't have much space for new buildings in general. They are one of the most cleanest countries in the world. In fact, they banned chewing gum in 1992 in efforts to keep the streets clean. And climbing, let's face it, is a pretty gritty sport. Their culture in general is extremely focused on excelling in academics, which you would think wouldn't allow much time for athletic recreation, but despite all these implications that would make it difficult for a climbing culture to bloom, in Singapore it does exist, and it is much more rich than seen at first glance. Singapore is tiny. For American viewers, Rhode Island is our smallest state at 1,212 square miles, and is over four times larger than the 278.6 square miles island that Singapore is. Google lists four climbing gyms in Rhode Island, but in Singapore, and I have to stress it's four times smaller, has over 15 gyms and even an outdoor crag. The ratio of gyms to the size of the country is something that can't be ignored, and many citizens in Singapore climb recreationally. In an enigmatic way, it makes sense. I've met so many climbers that are doctors, programmers, or hold other high-end positions, and in Singapore, there is a high concentration of smart and successful people who I'm sure are attracted to the problem-solving aspect that climbing offers. And yes, in a long-winded way, I'm basically saying that if you're into climbing, you are probably smart. Now this is a series about climbing styles, and although understanding the culture is really important, let's break down the climbing style of some of the Singaporean climbers. In the SMU Gravicol 2020 Open Finals, a competition held by one of the universities, I paid very close attention to the number one qualified climber, Gavin Xiang. Watching clips of him climb made me feel like I was watching an emulation of another climber. Can you guess who that is? Watch him climb this problem I found on his Instagram. He's light on his feet, when he cuts his feet from the wall it's almost effortless, and he loves going to dinos with one hand. Sound familiar? If I were to describe Gavin's climbing style as an emulation of another, I would compare it to Kai Harada. On the female side, Li Ting Shu caught my attention because she reminded me of another great Japanese climber, Risa Oda. She is great at swinging her hips to gain momentum, and they both look as if they float through the holds. But in order to get a better understanding on how the culture in Singapore has been molded, I was able to talk to the very talented North Face ambassador, writer, presenter, athlete, YouTuber, actually, I could talk another 10 minutes of the accomplishments she's done, so maybe it's best to let her introduce herself. I'm Sophia Jin, I work in Outdoors Adventure Media and I'm based in London but I'm currently in Singapore which is where I grew up and my family still lives. So perhaps maybe we can first start off by explaining how do bouldering gyms in Singapore look and differ from maybe the London gyms you've been to? 
Yeah, so the first thing that like instantly pops out, to me at least, and I know to friends of mine as well, is that the standard of the average climber here is generally higher in Singapore compared to at least the gyms I've climbed at in England. Um, I have a friend who, like me, grew up in Singapore but now studies in Canada who climbs at least one or two grades lower when back here at certain gyms. And I think like this is obviously reflected in the setting. But, like in London, there are very few true V6 climbers. Like, I mean, there are people who will, like people who will comfortably climb a V6. People either flash it or fall off at the start. But in Singapore, I definitely see more of those higher grade climbers around. And I think that's for a combination of reasons. Like, firstly, they're just more visible. Like, the ratio of newcomers to regulars in the climbing gyms here is, at the moment, at least due to COVID, pretty imbalanced. I can rock up to a climbing gym in London and see like 20 new people who've never climbed before. Whereas here, even though climbing's definitely growing in popularity, the majority of the gym have experience. So the setting does cater more to these regulars and to those people who have more experience. And like the easy problems here can be pretty difficult. They're not very intuitive for a beginner. They don't necessarily spell it out for you. In London, if I see a route that's tagged B2 or B3, I know exactly what to expect. Almost 100% of the time I'm right, but here they can actually be pretty tough. Like the Singaporean B3 compared to London B3 is different. <laughs> like for example, there was a V2 slash V3 problem in a gym here called Boulder Plus I saw today that requires people to pinch this undercling in like a really strange way that it's not intuitive if you were a beginner you would really struggle on it. And I've seen everyone try it numerous times. Um, the, like, the climbing here is part, like past a certain low level, generally really technical and technique based. I think in the past, there was a much stronger focus on brute strength and like, like brute force strength based stuff. And there are so many crushes here. Um, like Singapore is small, a small country, small space. There's not a lot of space for these competition style boulders, like what I like to call parkour climbs, at least dinos. Instead, we have more complicated routes and smaller holds. So being strong and having really good technique is most important. And so if what Sophia is saying sounds familiar to the previous episode, you would be absolutely correct. It's no surprise that Singapore has taken many attributes and qualities of the climbing infrastructure of Japan and brought it back to their own country. Their concentration of climbing gyms is a clear standout similarity. As well as I do know that setters from Singapore climb and do clinics with Japanese setters. I heard and I know that some really, there's this amazing uh, like German setter that's done clinics there as well as I know they've uh, had Japanese setters come to Singapore and sort of give clinics. So I'm wondering if a lot of the influence is actually external and then they sort of develop from their own style from there. You know, I think that could be true because the owners I was speaking to today, <laughs> a lot of them have just said that they've climbed in Japan. Uh, so I do feel like they they do borrow a lot as well. Yeah. Um, but again, a lot of them have experienced bouldering outdoors and that's like the owners of Border Plus are especially passionate about recreating that. Actually, I was at another wall for sport climbing, Safra Yishun, and they have done the exact same thing where they've tried to make it as close to being outside as possible. Mm. Their grades are whack. Like I was, I was on a 5C that all of us were like, this is not a 5C. The, you, the, the holds are really far apart, which is something people complain about. But specifically with Safari Yishin, the holds are really far apart. And you're meant to use the texture of the wall, which they've just textured in a really uh, authentic way. They've made it like an outside wall because you're meant to use that wall instead when you can't reach the hold. And yeah, that's that's amazing, I think. But it's not a complete one-for-one -one emulation of Japan either. Since there is an extremely limited amount of outdoor climbing in Singapore, in fact, there's really only one known outdoor crag, the Dairy Farm Wall, I learned from Sophia that there are many gyms that try and simulate outdoor climbing moves. Things are changing. Climbing's growing in popularity here for sure, and there are more and more bouldering gyms popping up. Like since I came back last time, there's been like two or three new ones emerged. And I, I do think, 
because of like the growing popularity, setters are now starting to achieve a, a mix of different styles. Today alone, I did like a climbing crawl through different gyms and I was doing problems that required me to diner, knee bar, bat hang. I had like a pretty balanced experience. But also you hear in Singapore, the styles vary between different bouldering gyms and each kind of has its own reputation. So like people often talk about this bouldering gym called Boulder Plus as being extra challenging. And I thought about it today because my climbing crawl ended up at Boulder Plus and I realized that actually most of the walls there at this negative incline like they come out towards you there are loads of really small crimpy holds and then I got a chance to talk to the owner who was there today and they were saying that they were actually trying to make it as close to bouldering outdoors as possible ah. like that's why it's like that so like indoors it can be really easy to learn these routines and move in the same way across a perfectly vertical wall but outside you're like hugging the rock and that experience they replicated across virtually the entire center which is why people find that one so challenging so if anything what i've been learning is that the way singaporean gyms like many asian gyms are built around necessity they are built small due to space and they try to fill the niche that they need to fit but let's go back and talk about the SMU Gravicol 2020 Open Finals. This, uh, let me remind you, was a collegiate competition. They had production value, international setters, international climbers, and top tier climbing talent all around. I can't think of a single university competition that has that many resources to have all the amenities that the SMU Gravicol had to offer. However, I did some research, and as serious as Singaporeans take their university studies, they take their athletics just as seriously, and they go hand in hand. Um, they are very structured. The teams here take it really seriously. I go into the gym, I see them all wearing their like, different team shirts, and obviously, because if you're on the team, you're there to win and to compete. They train seriously. Uh, this idea of structure, I think, is quite prevalent throughout climbing in Singapore as well. Uh, Singaporeans grow up with a lot of structure in their lives and in school and the part, I suppose like the career paths are expected to take. Um, it's, it's reflected everywhere, even in that like, I didn't realize that I would need to, and I think this is actually a thing in the States as well, but it's not in some of the gyms I go to in London. You need to get your lead verification tag. So you'll go like lead verification, belay verification, and you do those tests and you get like a card to show at all the gyms in Singapore, the, the sport climbing gyms. Um, it's, it's like, it's a structured process. And that is again, like replicated in the university team's training. They take it seriously. The structure behind the university system clearly shows in the climbing teams that are formed from the universities producing great talent. I know that Singaporean climbers aren't known for being at the top of the podium at World Cup events, but going through Gavin Shams and Li Ting Xu's Instagram, I have a feeling that in time you might see their names pop up soon at the top ranks and give Singapore a bit more time and I have no doubts that we'll see Singaporeans standing on podiums soon. During the 2018 Climbing Wall Association Conference in Colorado, I had the opportunity to interview the inventor and founder of BelaySafe a Singaporean climbing company that designed a one-way friction device that, in the case of emergency and absolute belay failure, the device will catch the climber and lower them slowly. This isn't a sponsored video, but I wanted you to hear the story of Halil and why he created this device. I just got mentioned about that you uh, once saved someone while you were speed climbing at a, at a facility. Yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a callous mistake, so... Uh, climbing wasn't clipped in properly and uh, and fell out. Fell the carabiner fell out and I was in I was in the area and you know, I, I ran forward to try and uh, catch the fall and broke my arm in the, in, the, in the process. Yeah, it's a long story. Yeah, it's but that, that was uh, one of the reasons why our company was uh, was built up. When I broke my arms, I couldn't do anything. I can't climb anymore. <laughs> so why not start a company? Whether it's his compassion or bravery, I have a feeling that Halil's act to save the falling climber is more deeply rooted than just a single anecdotal incident. From everything I've gathered and heard about Singaporean climbers, it's that their number one asset, more than anything, is that they really, really care about climbing. Their one crag is chossy, it's humid, it's sandbag, but the people that love it, love it. Their schedules are busy, but they make time. 
The Climbing is an amalgamation of influence from around the world, but they've taken it and made it their own. And as much as this series is about climbing styles, I think in this case, the culture that has been created in such a short period of time is reflected in their climbing style. Singapore, the name derives from the Sanskrit word Simhapura, which translates to Lion City. And that is a great way to describe the country and the climbers. Singapore is a small country, but its roar is loud. The climbers there may not be known all around the world, but they are proud of what they have accomplished in a short period of time, and they let it be known. Their country is small, but they have over a dozen gyms. Their country is clean, but they love the gritty sport of climbing. The climbers may be shorter, but they climb with ferocity. They may be busy, but they make time. They truly climb with the spirit of the lion. And as always, keep crushing it. Thank you so much, Sophia, for being a part of this episode. You've helped me get a lot of insight on the Singaporean culture and climbing culture that is over there. Maybe you can plug in whatever you have going on, what's going on with you in life, what's next? What's next for thee, Sophia Jin? Well, follow me to see. I have exciting projects coming up with sponsors across outdoors adventure, not just climbing, hiking, canyoning, all that crazy stuff. If you can do it in the mountains, I am doing it. Well, thank you so much, Sophia. That is awesome. I'll leave links in the description below to all of the things that you can follow Sophia on her next adventure and that she'll be hopefully safe and sound after she is done. All right, Bye. thank you.